Well, thanks very much. It's uh, my uh, great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, another great leader in the area of uh, technology, as well as a variety of other things, environmental policy, uh, the technology policy. Uh, she's on the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, so she's involved in a wide variety of uh, policy discussions that are very important to our economy. Uh, somebody who probably doesn't need uh, much of an introduction to this group, but who is a friend of this group and I think will have some interesting things to say to us, Congresswoman Mary Bono Mack. Well, good morning. You guys are a lot brighter-eyed and more bushy-tailed than I expected, actually. I think the last breakfast or morning speech I gave was a long time ago, and it was to the convention for the beer wholesalers. In the morning, they were kind of sluggish and moving slowly, and I vowed I would never do another morning speech uh, again in Washington, especially as a Californian. I'm generally not too awake uh, by this time in the morning. But I am delighted to be here with you, uh, extremely delighted. Before I go on, I want to take this opportunity, so I won't forget, to introduce to you. My husband is here with me this morning. I'm a long time, uh, it's 48 days now we've been married, I think, Connie. Um, Con Congressman Connie Mack is here in the front row. So Connie, thank you so much for being here. And you talk about someone who's not very bright-eyed and bushy-tailed today, it's Connie. He was, we were busy last night watching the Florida returns. And uh, I probably shouldn't say, well, he's with Romney, so he's very proud of that fact. I was with Rudy. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Somebody. <laughs> so last night, Connie was telling me, babe, you're with Rudy, so um, from now on, I don't want you going to Las Vegas, <laughs> to racetracks, dog tracks, bingo, Indian casinos, anywhere, uh, <laughs> because you kind of chose the guy who didn't last very long. So my brother told us something very clever. He said, in marriage, you can either be right or you can be happy. So yes, dear, you were right. But uh, <laughs> um, the last thing, you think that being married to a member of Congress when you have a speech that you're a little bit jittery about, I don't come by this naturally, you guys. You probably know my story. I came into Congress as a widow, and I was not prepared for this. I had never even spoken publicly. So 10 years into it, yes, I still get very nervous when I speak. I get nervous in my trait when I'm nervous as my nose runs. So if you see this um, coming out, you'll know it's because I'm nervous. But so Connie, just to make things even better for me, said, you know, as, as a woman, generally when we walk up to a podium, you're worried, I'm wearing high heels, am I going to trip, and I'm going to fall. Even though we walk every day of our life, when you walk up to a podium, you think you're going to fall. Don't ask me why. But so I'm over this. I'm getting over my jitters. And I say to Connie, it's even great because I have a prepared speech today. I'm prepared. It can't be that hard. And then Connie was sure to say, but babe, you know what scares me the most is I get really worried about turning the page. So <laughs> thank you, honey, <laughs> for, for the support. But as you heard, I sit on the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee, and I sit on the subcommittee on telecom telecommunications and the internet. This gives me an up-close and personal view of how the sector of our economy has grown and how the technology itself is maturing. I am passionate about the preservation and protection of intellectual property, especially digital and, uh, inter intellectual property. As we discuss internet policy matters, protecting IP is one of my highest priorities. In fact, when I approach internet policy decisions, the very first thing I ask myself is how will this impact intellectual property? So looking at our current economic landscape and the volatility of global and U.S. financial markets, a bright spot for growth that stands out is our technology sector which obviously includes the internet, both wireless and wireline, and all the digital creations moving along cyberspace. However, I do see a potential vulnerability with the internet's commercial potential in its digital content, the music, the games, the software, and the audiovisual works. As you all know, digital creations are constantly being threatened by piracy and by illegal downloading. Two of the fundamental economic challenges we face as a country are First, how do we protect digital creations online? And secondly, how do we balance the role and the powers of the private sector with those of the government as they relate to the Internet? Whatever the solution, it must be effective because piracy, both global and domestic, is currently undermining America's economy and financial well-being. IDC, an independent group that studies software piracy, reported that 35 percent of the software installed in 2006 on personal computers worldwide was obtained illegally, amounting to nearly $40 billion in global losses due to software piracy. 
In the U.S. alone, that amount was $7 billion. Piracy results in over $6 billion in losses to the, United, to, the, excuse me, to the American film industry annually, costing the United States an additional 141,000 jobs. And according to the Institute for Policy Innovation, global music piracy causes $12.5 billion of economic losses every year. 71,060 U.S. jobs lost, a loss of $2.7 billion with a B, in workers' earnings and a loss of $422 million in tax revenues, $291 million in personal income tax, and $131 million in lost corporate income and production taxes. You talk about an economic stimulus package, look at these numbers. So given this current scenario, I think it's important to take a step back and to try to put the Internet into some sort of technological perspective. With all of the euphoria and all of the venture capital and the buzz, this can be difficult. But the advent of cyberspace is an arc along technology's vast frontier. Am I saying the Internet is not radical or magnificent? Not at all, because it is. Am I minimizing the importance or the promise of the Internet? Not at all. The truth is digital technologies are changing the way we organize, work, get information, form political opinions, run campaigns, communicate, unwind at the end of the day, and for me, shop. But as a Harvard economist writes, the emergence of cyberspace is not an unprecedented event. The development of technologies like the printing press and the compass, telegraphy, railroads, steamships, and radio all had jarring long-term effects on human behavior in global economies. And like the Internet, all of these technologies went through various cycles of innovation and commercialization. So what does the history of these previous technological innovations teach us about the private sector and the role of government? And what does that mean for the continued development of the Internet? History has taught us that property rights, commercial acceptance, and greater sense of certainty leads to greater investment and increased growth. But what are the roles of the government and the private sector? First, we must admit that the formation of property rights is one of the most critical developments to establishing technologically oriented markets. These rights provide certainty and give trend-setting property owners and innovators a stronger sense of security in their investments and in their products. Given this fact, we must acknowledge that there is a role for the state when it comes to property rights. One of the primary functions of governments is the preservation of its citizens' property. Our founders recognized this and put it into the Constitution. Other governments have taken similar steps. And as to those governments that haven't, I think Hernando de Soto said it best when he made the point that a lack of strong property rights rather than poor economic management has caused many of the world's economies to remain in poverty. The issue of property rights becomes more complicated on the Internet because the property itself isn't tangible. I also think the issue of property rights is more difficult in Congress because a lot of members of Congress don't truly understand technology. Just one little anecdotal story. I remember not too long ago a powerful, when we were in the blessed majority, powerful chairman on a committee that should have had a lot of technological savvy who's no longer with us, so I, but I won't say his name because he's out there somewhere, <laughs> but saw another member walking down the aisle with something we all know and love with an iPod around his neck. Is there anybody in this room who hasn't seen it or know what an iPod is? I didn't think so. But this committee chairman did ask the member of Congress what that was around his neck. So that's not a, a, a false story. It's a true story. And sometimes it's rather disconcerting to know that members of Congress don't actually and don't tell anybody this, but members of Congress don't actually always know everything. But it is complicated, and, and as I've said, it, problems of nationality surround the Internet, since property rights are generally territorial by design, while the Internet is not, although there are international agreements related to the issue. Yet even with this complexity and difficulty, there are competing forces at work fighting for the preservation of intellectual property rights. These forces largely come from those with commercial interests and admittedly are in the private sector. Firms like Microsoft and Amazon need property rights to preserve their incentive to develop software and to improve services. Firms like NBC Universal, 
Warner Music and Disney and bands like my favorites, the Cowboy Junkies and the Who, need property rights to give them le legal recourse when digital pirates rip them off, literally. But legal recourse and legal property rights framework, while vital, are an after-the-fact answer. They are not solutions to the problem of digital piracy. When legal recourse is taken, the proverbial genie is already out of the bottle. There must be other mechanisms more agile and flexible than government allowed to be put in place to let those who own digital property or those whose work in concert with digital property owners to have the technological agility and flexibility to take the necessary steps to protect that digital property. The primary means of illegal downloading, illegally downloading movies and other copyrighted content is through peer-to-peer -peer or P2P file transfers over broadband, broadband networks. As you are all aware, with the accelerating growth of P2P and broadband access, the Internet is becoming the dominant mechanism for content piracy. In the early stages of the Internet's development, many broadband service providers were not as focused as online piracy as they probably should have been. However, if you've been paying attention to recent developments and stories being reported by the press, you can almost feel a change in philosophy taking place. Is this because the service providers suddenly found religion and got the issue of digital property rights? Maybe, but I'd be willing to bet it had a lot more to do with the congestion of their networks. Depending on who you listen to, as much as, as 60 to 70 percent of traffic on the Internet consists of P2P file transfers by a very small minority, fewer than 5 percent of users. P2P thus outstrips every other communication and distri distribution protocol on the Internet and continues to grow exponentially. To put this statistic in greater perspective, perhaps 90% of P2P file transfers are in violation of our nation's copyright laws. So back to the providers' motivations. The service providers are watching more and more of their ne network capacity monopolized by P2P bandwidth hogs who command a disproportionate amount of their network resources. This, in turn, is having a negative impact on their networks and the provision of core services for mainstream consumers, such as web, web surfing and sending email. So you might be asking yourself, why don't the broadband service providers invest more into their networks and simply add more capacity? Well, for the record, broadband service providers are investing in their networks, but simply adding more bandwidth does not solve this dilemma. The reason for this is P2P applications are designed by nature to consume as much bandwidth as possible. Thus, more capacity only results in more consumption. So what is the private sector, particularly ISPs and digital content owners, to do? I believe the best chance we have for achieving any success against digital piracy is to allow those entities and individuals who manage networks to have the flexibility and the agility to take the lawful and necessary steps to stop piracy online before it starts. We must all understand that what works in one instance may not be successful in another. The battle against digital piracy is a very fluid exercise. Network operators and digital property owners should be free to experiment with and to develop anti-piracy technologies. If we as policymakers allow this to occur and practice vigilant regulatory restraint when it comes to the Internet, then we as a country can regain our digital footing and recoup the immense financial losses that piracy causes. And when this occurs, will, there will be greater market certainty, larger investments, and this will cause the technology we call the Internet to continue to evolve and to grow, far exceeding anyone's expectations. Will this make anyone ha everyone happy? Probably not, but what can these days? I'm sure some interest groups here or there will complain, probably online, and they should have the opportunity to do so. However, however, we are talking about protecting property rights and the future of a great technology. In order to make thoughtful decisions that allow this technology to grow and benefit our national and global economy, we must not let political populism replace innovative practicality. So long before the Internet, our founders understood the principle of protecting property rights. Today, it is our responsibility to understand and to act in accordance with these principles. I certainly believe we can, and I know we must. 
So I want to thank you again for having me today. It's an honor to be with you all, and I guess I'm going to stick around for a couple of, I have um, a flight to catch out of Dulles eventually. I was going to go to the debate in California, but now my night is free. <laughs> but, I still, but I still have a flight to catch out of Dulles, so I think I have time for a few questions. So anybody have anything on their mind they want to? You can do questions. Compliments are always welcome, too. Any thoughts you have about anything? See? It's like the beer wholesalers all over again. Mike Nelson with Georgetown University. I, I know your position and, and the role you've played in supporting intellectual property protection, but I, I was a little surprised that in the entire speech you didn't really talk about fair use, the importance of information for education, the role of parity, political speech. And to hear your speech, there seems to be no downside to increasing intellectual property protection as much as we want. And so I just a couple quick questions. Would you support doubling the penalties on copyright theft? Well, I do believe Howard Berman has had a bill in Congress, pro-IP it's called, where it addresses this. Your, your question about that I didn't address fair use, there are, I believe the debate on fair use is still out there. Certainly we have seen that a great deal, the librarians concerned. Uh, Getting back to my question though, would, sure. you, would you support tripling yes. or quadrupling the penalties? Getting back to the answer, uh, Howard Berman's pro-IP bill is one that I do believe in. Yes. Would you support a factor of 10? increase? I in don't know to what degree. That's a, something that will go through the, the Judiciary Committee and I'll happily look at. But What about patent protection? Should we ex extend that as well? Should we increase the terms of patent factor of three? There is it a reasonable, reasonable amount without a doubt. And I think, you know, as somebody who argued for not patent protection but intellectual, uh, uh, for IP, extending what they call the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act was heard before the Supreme Court and they did uphold the fact that extending it was a reasonable amount. Perpetuity is something differently. You know, I'm sort of known as somebody who says that copyright should last for forever minus a day. What I did was quote Jack Valenti and my late husband Sonny Bono and I made that comment and I do believe there are reasonable terms. I think Congress can look at that. I think the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act was a good example I think the Supreme Court upheld our decision in that, in that case. It wasn't patent, it was, copy, it was copyright. But there are reasonable terms. So the question is... No, I do not support eternal copyright. Absolutely not. But I do believe, I think the Sonny Bono copyright extension was a fair extension. Are you one of the people who believed I said that? You can't believe everything you read on the internet. Yeah. That was an internet myth. No, I do. And I, I, I think between the Congress and if, if, if people want to challenge us before the courts, then they can. And they've upheld it before and they will. And I do believe there are reasonable times for something to go into the public domain. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Larry Mack at CBS News. Uh, I'm a copyright holder myself, so clearly I understand the need to protect intellectual property. But also I'm a father of a college student and a recent college graduate. And I look around at young people and I see that there seems to be a widespread belief among young people in America that it is okay to download music and distribute music. And I'm wondering not whether we should abolish copyright, but whether we should be looking at some of the more creative ways that the music industry and the movie industry are finding to monetize their, protect, their, their products. And perhaps realizing maybe we can't legislate and arrest our way or prosecute our way around this problem. I mean, is it possible? that the industry and certain elements of government are going about this in absolutely the wrong way? I think there's plenty of blame to go around. I think to stick it solely on the government is, is pretty short-sighted. For me, and I have, am the mother of a college student, and he's a guitar player, and also former pirate. <laughs> Somebody who, my kids both had Kazaa on their computers, and I had to explain to them, my daughter and I were driving in a car, maybe some of you have heard me say the story, driving in a car and the cracker cover of the Dobie Gray song, you know, Drift Away. If you don't know it, I'm not going to sing it up here. We can, I'll spare you all of that. But my daughter literally said to me, Mom, you know what, I'm going to go home and, and burn this song, rip this song off, burn this song, whatever she said. And I slammed on the brakes of the car and had to explain to her, you know, for less than the price of a can of Coca-Cola, you can download that song legally and support, maybe not Uncle Cracker, and I don't know if we all know who he is, but he's a, you know, he's successful at the time, but you're supporting everybody involved with making that record. And she finally got it. 
less than the price of a can of Coca-Cola, and I'm supporting the artists that I, that I enjoy. But the labels, in my mind, if, you know, my friends who are in the room who are from the record labels and the, you know, the movie studios as well, they tried to suppress, in my estimation, my opinion, they tried to suppress the internet from evolving. Rather than seeing the amazing delivery tool that the internet was, they stood in the way of that progress in who better than anybody else can find their way around technology and sort of invent their own and, and post-market change our, our business models on the internet. Those are the college students. They were the perfect people to find ways to do this file sharing and exploit it to its fullest. So in my view, the business models are going to have to evolve. I was just talking to Rick Lane from News Corp about technologies that they're experiencing, you know, in the beta form right now on how to get delivery systems out there again that benefit uh, the consumer and the studios. And I was excited to hear, hopefully, the writers and put an end to this writer strike because I'm tired of re reruns and you guys are, are probably too. So I don't know if that is the real answer. I think it's got to be a combination of, of congressional, perhaps hopefully only oversight and not legislation, and that the business models evolve, but they recognize the power of the internet and recognize that there are far more opportunities out there by embracing the internet than by suppressing the internet. And you know, sometimes I compare our political campaigns to what the record labels endured too, is we're all evolving to figure out, it seems every week some politicians got the latest, greatest way of reaching out via the internet. And if we don't know ourselves how to do it, we're going to be the ones left holding the bag. And you know, the, the definition of Darwinism is not the strongest will survive, it's those who are most likely to adapt. And that holds true more with the internet, I think, than anywhere else in our current business world. So anybody else? No, well, again, thank you very, very much for having me today. And what you're doing is immensely important. And, and I always say it, that in Congress, we have so many issues that be come before us. And if you're not before us educating us and talking to us, then somebody else is. And you are the experts. And I always find as a member of Congress, it's rather intimidating to go before the experts and act like we are the true experts when you guys are. So please, if you have thoughts, concerns, issues, want to educate me, come to my office and see me. I'd like to point out Paul Concien in the red tie um, is my uh, legislative assistant on these issues. And uh, I'd be happy to give you his uh, cell phone number, home email, home telephone, <laughs> if you have any complaints. So thank you all very, very much, and enjoy your day.